All right. So good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Haley. I am with Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday. Uh, today is our pollinator gardens workshop. So we are going to be doing about um, around 45 minutes to an hour of the presentation. And then there will be time at the end for some open Q&A. But of course, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to use the chat box feature. Um, and we might be able to actually answer those throughout the meeting or we can even uh, wait till the end, just depends on how the flow is. But definitely if you have questions, we wanna hear from you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over. With us today is Isabel Hernandez. She is with the Inland Empire Waterkeeper. Uh, she, I'm sure she's familiar to those of you that have attended before. Uh, she is very knowledgeable about waterwise landscaping, irrigation, um, and everything of the like. So definitely, if you have those questions for her, please take advantage of, of her being here today. Um, and we'll go ahead and Isabel, I'm gonna pass it on over to you. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone. Of course, we are grateful that Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District has sponsored this Pollinator Garden virtual workshop presentation. And again, my name is Isabel Hernandez and I am with Inland Empire Waterkeeper and I will be your presenter for today. Okay, let's see if we can get this. So one of the first questions we're obviously going to ask is why pollination is important. Now food, of course, is crucial to not only us as humans, but animals as well. And fruit, foods, plants, and seeds are all dependent on pollination. Without pollinators, the human race and all of the Earth's terrestrial ecosystem obviously would uh, not survive. Almost 80% of the crops grown around the world are dependent on pollinators. So one of the things that of course we wanna do is encourage pollinators into our landscapes and visits from hummingbirds, uh, butterflies, bees, and other pollinators also result in larger, more flavorful fruit and higher crop yields. Obviously we cannot replicate nature and by even attempting to, we do not come close in results with the size or flavor or yield of crops. So uh, it's pretty crucial, of course. And obviously another uh, factor for pollination is cleaner air. Plants obviously produce breathable oxygen, which is crucial to all, our, all of our existence. And finally, soil and water are also um, plants that um, help purify water and prevent erosion through roots um, that hold the soil in place and foliage that buffer the impact of rainfall on the earth. Now, one thing I wanna share about that is that back in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl depression happened and we learned quite a bit from it. Obviously the unusual high temperatures uh, played a huge factor in the situation. Uh, we are familiar with those high temperatures. Obviously, it's become more common to us as well. And what happened was that at the time, poor agriculture practices were um, really in, in, in play. And that's when they were basically plowing soil to uh, so fine that there weren't any roots that would prevent the soil from eroding. Obviously, water is one of the uh, one of the most common erosions in soil, but in this situation, it was the winds. And the winds actually did a, a huge impact at the time that it caused darkness and of course, so much dust that it destroyed so much and also took about seven, 7,000 lives, um, mostly children from what was called uh, dust pneumonia. So we've learned quite a bit from it and we know that having plants in the soil and roots in the soil is very crucial to preventing this type of situation because obviously many factors were involved but they are very common to, be, um, uh, to happen again. So uh, one of those, one of those uh, benefits of pollinations is that it does maintain plants and it prevents such a, such a situation from reoccurring. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Obviously we're all here because we're interested in installing a pollinator garden into our landscape. And of course, this is 
going to be something that you're going to introduce into your home, into your property, and it could be as, as formal and meticulous and, and um, manicured with the formality that you see in the picture of the left lower hand corner, or it can be as informal as a walking meadow um, and more uh, nature um, inspired. And for those of you that find a little bit in between, you can obviously just do a little vignette or a little installation within your home, introducing into your front yard, maybe just in front of a beautiful um, window bay, uh, a bay window, and of course, even into your patio on the, on the side or around it as a little focal point. So there are many ways of introducing it either um, formally or informally, and of course, and in just uh, integrating it to what you may already have pre-existing. Now, of course, for those of you that do have uh, the, the desire but not the area, container gardens are also very good pollinator uh, gardens. Many of them you may be most attractive to when you go to the garden centers, don't realize that you're actually obtaining at times pollinator gardens. And of course you can emulate this and put it in your patios, in your balconies, in your front uh, porches, or any little corner of your home that you can just add a splash of color and some direction for these pollinators to come in and feast on. Of course, we wanna talk about the pollinators that are most favored. And that uh, of course, on the top of the list happens to be butterflies. Many people are very attracted to them. They find them to be very soothing to, to um, view. And uh, monarchs happen to be one of the more common and more favored. But we wanna share a little bit of information about them just so that you have a better understanding of how they are or and just facts about them. Uh, butterflies are, are led by scent and smell. So ensuring that you have a, a plant that provides that will obviously attract them into your landscape. And of course, something that um, many of you may not know, something I didn't know myself, was that they actually taste with their feet. And, um, uh, and many of you do know this, and that is that they also are migratory. And one of the reasons for it, of course, is the following. Butterflies cannot fly if they are cold. So they will seek out warmer temperatures and travel into warmer temperatures, um, of course, migrating into those areas um, to avoid the cold snaps or the cold climate that they may be in at the time. Uh, we do know that butter butterflies life cycle is made up of four parts, which includes the egg, the larva, which is a caterpillar. That is when they have the most voracious appetite, the pulpa, which is a chrysalis, and of course, as they emerge into adults. And with butterflies and moths, you may find a lot of familiarities, but there's some significant differences. Of course, uh, the active uh, time and the time that they seek out food for butterflies is going to be during the day, where in turn in moths, it'll be during the night. The wings will rest um, in a butterfly closed while with a moth, it'll stay opened. And the antenna is clubbed in a butterfly where in a moth, it is thick and feathered. Uh, also, the body of a butterfly is normally uh, normal to thin where the moth is fuzzy and thick. And here you see a white line thinks moth on the bottom uh, right hand side. And that hey, happens to Isabel? be- Sorry, yes. real quick, um, I, and something I didn't mention just so everyone that's on today knows, we, are, we will be providing this presentation. It is gonna be available on the website next week. So anything we don't miss or we wanna recouch on, it, it will be made available. Okay, well, one of the things that I had been sharing about uh, butterflies and moths, for those of you, this may not make sense, but seeing it on the screen now, we talked about fun facts about how they lead by scent and how they taste with their feet. They migrate and they do so because they cannot fly in the cold. 
We talked about the four parts of the, of the caterpillar of the butterfly's uh, life cycle. And I shared differences between uh, butterflies and moth. And of course, um, they're, they're complete opposites in many senses. One of the samples, of course, would happen to be the monarch butterfly and the white line thinks moth. Now this happens to be the one that pollinates plumerias. Many of you are also passionate with that amazing scented uh, Hawaiian tree. And this is the pollinator that actually generates the seed pods for those of you that want to perpetuate more plants in regards to um, doing that with your landscape. Now let's go to the monarch butterflies. Now the milkweed plants uh, that are commercially available happen to be uh, not very many. Unfortunately, we do have several in Southern California that are native milkweeds, uh, but for commercial purposes, the narrow leaf Asclepias and Fasciculiris is the one that is most readily available if, if it can be found. Um, the tropical milkweed, of course, is not a California native. And what I want to share about that is that if you, you must cut it down in October. Um, and that is for the concerns of the uh, OE parasite. And obviously, we, for the disruption of migration behavior. One thing that happens with milkweed is that it continues to perpetuate year round. And as long as these monarch butterflies happen to have a source of food, they may, it may disrupt their migration. Obviously, Southern California weather, uh, we normally have, you know, um, warm weather as late as December. But when that cold snap comes in in January, it may just be too late for them to migrate to better, warmer climates. And I also want to share that you may also want to be a little more cautious about what is in these tropical milkweed plants from some of the growers, which is the neonicotitis pesticide. We're going to talk a little more about it, but unfortunately, um, some of the home stores do uh, treat these plants previously just so that they can aesthetically sell them a little better. But unfortunately, if you introduce this to your um, to your uh, plant, uh, monarchs, of course, within a day of consumption, they will die because it's a pesticide. Now talking about California natives again, you have the showy milkweed, the California milkweed, the heart, the heart leaf milkweed, the woolly milkweed and the woolly pod milkweeds. Now all of those are also Southern California native milkweeds. And I, I hate to say this, but unfortunately many of the nurseries, uh, local nurseries, um, landscapers don't readily carry these, but they can be purchased through seeds, uh, many times through uh, online purchases. So for those of you that might be interested in, in a milkweed, and some of these milkweeds do not reflect the commonality that you see in the tropical milkweed or the California native milkweed, the narrow leaf. So they happen to appear a little bit different, maybe not as attractive. One of the reasons why they may not be uh, uh, commercially providing them, but they are um, definitely avail uh, available for the introduction into the, into the landscape. And let's talk about our next one, hummingbird backs. Now hummingbirds of course are another one of the favorite uh, pollinators for gardens and hummingbirds happen to have an average lifespan of three to five years and their breeding is from March to July. May is peak season and listen to this everyone. The nest making takes seven days. They lay two eggs and they hatch within 14 days and those little guys leave in three weeks. So within a six week time frame they breed and they move on. So mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons they probably don't have such a long lifespan um, and everything happens so quickly. They can fly up to 30 plus miles per hour. So they're very, very quick, very, um, they seem a little feisty to me, um, but it might just be their, their, their quick flight. 
um, but they eat insects, insect eggs and nectar, and they eat about seven, seven plus times an hour. So these little guys are always going to be consuming and hunting for food and seeking their nectar. So uh, having them, of course, is very, um, uh, is, it's something that a lot of people have made into a hobby and of course, um, help the ecosystem maintain a balance with insects. Um, another thing is that they have keen sight, so they do not depend on their smell and they are native only to the Americas. So therefore you guys can all brag along with me that uh, hummingbirds can only be found in North America, Central America and South America. You will not find them in Australia. You will not find them in Africa or Asia or the Middle East or in Europe. They are only among the Americas. And something I wasn't aware of is that large praying mantis can actually eat them. And uh, it just didn't seem realistic to me because of course I've seen many large praying mantis and at the speed that these hummingbirds do fly and some of the, even though they're small, the praying mantis, um, they are very voracious. I've, I've actually realized that and have witnessed um, an example of that happening. So it was an interesting uh, situation. So for those of you that Occasionally, these praying mantis um, become available as a, pre as, a, as a beneficial. If you're entertaining hummingbirds as your pollinators, you may not want to introduce the praying mantis. And that's one of the reasons this fun fact was shared. Okay, let's move on to the hummingbird feeder information. Many of you will be introducing um, hummingbird feeders into your landscape as a supplement for these hummingbirds to feed. And um, there's no judgment here, but I wanna share a recipe, of course, for the hummingbird feeder. You're gonna start off with a one cup of white sugar, four cups of water, and it's going to be dissolved in water. You're gonna add the sugar water to a clean feeder. Now here's the detail that is most crucial for everyone to understand is that you have to repeat this every two to four days. And for those of you that may have uh, on the internet already found other recipes that include honey or food coloring, please do not abide by those uh, suggestions. Um, and I'm gonna be sharing with you a little more about the reason why not to use honey. And of course, food coloring has no significant purpose for the hummingbird feeder itself. Uh, but I do wanna share with you that you wanna place the feeder about 15 to 20 feet away from a window. And the reason for it is because they do have uh, quite a bit of speed when they fly and they may not realize that they could fly into a window, especially from, uh, from a perspective that they are, um, they drop their guard to, to feed and of course, the instinctive thing to do is to dash away quickly. And, and this is a very common situation that happens very often. And you may find hummingbirds on the ground, not far from a window because they've crashed into them. So we suggest 15 to 20 feet away from windows. And of course, placing them in an open area that receives partial sun. And I'm gonna share one of the reasons why that's important. And Honestly, the, the one thing that is detrimental to understand is that we want to prevent mold spores from growing in the feeder. Now, we may, it, it may not be obvious to the naked eye that they're there, but if they are, they will cause the hummingbird to um, swell their tongues and therefore they will uh, die a very gruesome death and in many situations, while they're still feeding their young, so will their young die. So uh, preventing mole spores from growing in their feeder is very important. And that is one of the reasons we shared that you have to repeat uh, changing uh, the sugar every two, to th every two to four days. And of course, you need to clean the feeder in uh, every two days during hot summer weather. Um, and of course, every four days in cool weather. And this is, a, this is a very crucial commitment, like I said, because of course they may come in and feed um, 
the nectar that you've uh, created for them. But at the same time, it may just take a handful of days after for them to have their tongue completely swell to the point that they can no longer consume. So those are just interesting situations that I want you to be aware of. So if you do entertain a feeder, um, please remember to change it every two to two to four days. And the honey part, of course, honey has been known to have spores. And of course, that is not a good thing. And nor is it a recipe that is beneficial for them either. And that is, of course, why um, any recipes for hummingbird feeders with honey, you should completely avoid. The next thing we're going to be talking about uh, honey. Isabel, quick question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, someone wanted to know they have a lot of native plants in their landscape already that attract those hummingbirds. Yes, ma'am. Do you recommend that they would still get a hummingbird feeder in addition to the plant? No. Or is that really just a, a preference? It's a preference. Uh, many people just do it because, of course, they feel that they'll instantly come in, um, but that's not always the case. And of course, it seems like a lot of work just going back and thinking, wow, every two days I have to change this and disinfect and clean the feeder. It seems like a lot more work. And a lot of times, many people don't realize that by keeping up with that rule that is so crucial for them is really discarding a lot of sugar and a lot of sugar water because regardless of whether that sugar is consumed or not, you have to completely dump it out and clean the feeder. So if you have plenty of plants pollinator plants that can attract them. Believe me, it's not necessary whatsoever. But just because many people introduce them, this is just an information for them and obviously making them aware of the repercussions of not following through with the, with the um, protocol of it, changing the feeder and cleaning the feeder as well. Great, thank you. Okay. Now let's talk about the honeybee facts. Um, honeybees usually travel approximately two to three miles from their hive. So one thing that we do know is that they can fly up to 15 miles per hour. Bees maintain a temperature of 92 to 93 degrees Fahrenheit in their central broad nest, regardless of whether the outside temperature is 110 or 140 degrees. Now this little phenomenon, if you really take into account is something that I find very interesting. Um, of course, what that means is that they have to maintain this temperature in order to ensure that, the, that they don't end up melting and it, and, or that they don't end up freezing. And what they do is that they basically create a hovering uh, blanket and in, hot temperature, they fan and fan with their wings to just bring down that temperature. And of course, that's a lot of work um, and a lot of workers that, that are needed to, um, to do that. And another thing, of course, with bees is that they do die after they, especially honeybees, they are the only ones that do die after they sting. And I know that's a concern for a lot of people that may have family members or they themselves may, be, may suffer severe allergies or anaphylactic shock from honeybee stings, um, but they do die. And honeybees themselves are not uh, going to attack. Um, it's the Africanized uh, bee that seems to be the one that has that really bad you know, rap and concern. Um, but of course, occasionally you may get stung. There's no way of really predicting what triggers a honeybee to sting. Unless of course you're, you're you know, taunting them on, intentionally or threatening them. Um, but even then, most of them will flee before they fight. Um, one thing about honeybees that I want you to be very conscious of is that they are the ones that are mostly responsible for all of our vegetables, for all of our fruit and our seed crop in the United States, 80% of it. And that is a huge amount. Without them, we would not be able to consume the foods that we can um, at this time. There is no way that we as humans can replicate the quality of food or the, or the crop yield that we normally get. So we do need to be thankful for them and we do need to protect them in spite of our 
sentiments on their ability to sting or the threat that they may have for some family members with regards to their allergies. Now let's talk about the plants. Let's share information. For those of you that, that have obviously joined me in the past, uh, one thing that I always share with everyone is these five questions. The five questions to successfully grow pollinator plants, and that is to know what the plant needs are. Now, how much does it grow is a very crucial question because what you purchase at a nursery or home store may be small in scale in comparison to its full maturity. And you have to prepare for its full maturity because most maturity in plants, such as pollinator plants, will be uh, fully mature within six months to no more than a year. And uh, another thing, of course, is that you want to know how much lighting it needs. One thing I do know is that pollinator plants are going to require anywhere between partial to full sunlight. And obviously, one of the reasons for it is because they need to flower and the flower itself is going to require the sunlight. And that is how you basically gauge, but you really do want to know exactly for the particular plant that you're going to introduce the lighting needs. Now, another thing of course, is the kind of soil that it thrives in. Many of you have shared that you are introducing into your landscape, California natives. And I'm so proud of you because of course, there's not much you need to do with regards to the soil. California natives thrive in very poor clay soil. So therefore, there's uh, no need to amend and or be concerned with regards to what you need to do for it. But there are going to be some occasional plants that are showstoppers that are not California natives. And those you really do need to make sure that you uh, obviously entertain that plant in your landscape with the proper soil. Uh, which, which then leads to the question of how much water it does require. One thing that happens to work together is soil and water. The kind of soil that you have in your landscape, your native soil, will also determine how you're going to water. Not only do you need to know how much water a plant is going to require, but you also need to know the kind of soil that you have because soil whether it's sandy or clay, will completely be different watering methods. And we're gonna talk a little more about that in a little bit, but those are definitely questions that you need to be very conscious and aware of when you introduce a plant. And so having those four questions, the information taken care of and ensuring that you've done your homework with that plant, uh, more than likely you're not gonna have pest and disease, but you do wanna know what they are because a thriving plant is not necessarily going to be susceptible to pest or disease. But you do have factors that will definitely play, uh, come into play, such as being in close proximity to another plant similar or of similar pest or diseases that may make your plant susceptible simply because of close proximity. And that would be something that you want to always make observation for. So if you happen to have a neighbor who happens to maybe be a little uh, more relaxed with their landscaping and not, not always paying attention to the, their diseased plants, you may become a culprit of, uh, your plant may become a culprit of their pests and diseases simply because of close proximity. So I told you I was gonna share a little bit more about the soil. Well, I want you to know this is one method of determining what kind of soil you have. See, what you can do at home is fill a large clear glass jar halfway with soil from your nat native soil, lands from your personal landscape. And of course, then you want to fill the remaining half with um, tap water, leaving about one inch of air. And you want to attach a lid to it, of course, shake it vigorously until you have broken up any clods in the soil. Preferably not to add clods, break it down before, but when it does settle, usually a day later, it will create a divide. And you, as you can see on the illustration, um, clay will fall uh, to the bottom and silt will be usually midway. And then of course the sand will float to the top and you can see the difference. Now, 
to determine what kind of soil you have uh, will give you information about watering. But for those of you that want to stay on top of figuring this out, uh, you don't have to take notes. You can simply go see the Southern Cal Yard Transformation book on page 29. And every, inf every little detail that I just described to you will be on there. And you also will have more testing options. Now, Haley will be able to share with you where you can find this on their website. And it's a downloadable uh, book. Or for those of you that have attended other classes while we were doing um, on-site uh, presentations, you may have that book. Page 29 will definitely be your resource for that. Now, with regards to the soil types, we sh I shared with you that clay and sandy soil um, will vary on how you water. And it's so significant. I want you to see exactly how significant that is. See the spacing, if you were to do irrigation, would require clay to be a little further apart because it spreads over the top a lot, uh, a lot more. Sandy soil, on the other hand, penetrates deep. So it kind of seeps in like a sponge a lot faster, while clay has that hard surface and, it, and it'll spread before it actually seeps. With regards to the frequency of cycles, how much you're, how often you're going to water? Well, of course, you're going to water a lot more if you have clay soil because it dries a lot faster. But sandy soil takes a lot longer because it goes in deeper. And with regards to um, duration of your irrigation, you want to, um, with sandy soil, you basically irrigate a lot shorter because it goes in quite quickly. And with clay, you want to irrigate longer. But when you do, you also want it to be at a slow, uh, slow rate, because it takes a lot longer for that soil to absorb. With regards to sandy, you can go a lot, you can, you can definitely, um, inf the, the rate of infiltration is a lot faster, so you can water a lot faster. And with regards to drip irrigation, the difference is with clay, you use a one gallon per hour emitter. And with sandy soil, you can go with a two gallon, uh, a two gallon per hour emitter. So understanding that of course is going to help you when you are determining the watering needs um, for your plant. Your sandy soil, your clay soil will vary uh, uh, quite significant. Now, here we are going to share a pollinator plant list. Now, this is not a this is not particularly a list of of uh, California natives, and the reason I share this with you is because for those of you that want to go out and start your your project this weekend, these are your definitely go to plants that you can introduce um, into your garden if you go shopping just after this class to your home store your nursery, your local nursery, because they're readily available. You have rosemary that will grow either as a ground cover or as a shrub. And it's got fragrance, of course. So does a lavender. And lavender comes in so many varieties that you have variation in color, in scent, um, and also in the foliage. Uh, foliage also can be from very rich green to even a silver color. So you, you, it just depends on the variety that you obtain or purchase. And remember, always look at the size of the maturity because it'll also vary as well, just like the rosemary does. Rosemary can be a ground cover or a shrub. The bottle brush is a year round showstopper. It is going to attract pollinators without a doubt, almost year round. And it can be either a shrub or a tree that can grow 20 to 30 feet tall. So be able, you know, be, be uh, conscious of what exactly you might be looking to install in your landscape. And of course, always provide the appropriate space for it. Lantanas are very common. They are a go-to landscape plant for many uh, contractors. And they've come in an assortment of colors. Uh, you will find that the lantanas that are white and that are purple are going to be ground cover. They are not going to turn into bushes 
or shrubs that grow anywhere between three to six feet wide or up to four feet tall. So whatever color you choose, look at the size and see if you have the availability in your landscape for it. The salvia, also one that comes in a lot of uh, different varieties, uh, is one that is also going to attract uh, particularly hummingbirds and uh, they love it. And uh, it comes in various heights and, and a very, um, it's an attractive showstopper. The verbena, of course, is a ground cover that uh, obviously also trails and cascades. And the yarrow, that is a California native. You can find it, the archelia uh, yarrow, you can find it either in white, pink, or yellow. And that is going to go dormant for usually about three months out of the year. So one thing about California natives that you will find is that you will, they will bloom and they may be super bloomers usually in the spring or even sporadically in the summer. But usually at the end of summer, you will start seeing them dry out or die down because they do go dormant. It's a very common practice. And of course, this is how nature does maintain that sustainability of the migration and also um, because of the harsh climate, um, it ensures that they um, either go dormant or uh, that the plant goes dormant and the pollinators move on. Now, here is something that I want you guys all take note of. This is a pollinator garden resource. I could spend a lot of time talking about so many plants and so many options. And here we have a website that we normally endorse without, throughout many of our classes. Um, and this is called the inlandvalleygardenplanner.org. Uh, what you will find is that you can click on whatever option you're looking for. If you're seeking California natives, you can definitely click in and it'll show you everything that will thrive within the Inland Empire, including obviously areas of Elsinore that many of you um, usually question what kind of plants thrive in your area. You will also have the ability to find plant, uh, seek plants by function. I happened to click in one of the samples, the butterfly plants, and I found everything that was a butterfly plant that at the time is also a California native. So that narrows down the list and it gives me an option to see trees and shrubs and also vines and you know different options for particular areas that I might be considering. Now, the good thing about it is that if you actually just browse through it, you can use utilize all the functions, but if you log in and create an account, you will then be able to save your plant list and therefore uh, come back to it later on and not have to recreate this all over again and or even print them with either pictures or information about these plants. Now, every single plant that is on here is going to have all the, all the crucial information that I told you you needed to know about on there and a little more than that. Some even give you maintenance tips about them and will inform you of particular pests or diseases that they may be susceptible to. And the one thing that many of you may wanna walk away with that is a gold nugget for everyone is the watering cycle for these plants. It will tell you how many inches of water this plant is going to require in what month of the year. So you can make your adjustments as you need to with your particular plants as you introduce them. And of course, you don't necessarily have to pick California natives. You can simply pick um, any kind of plant. You can actually search a plant that you may have a preference for that may have nothing to do with pollinators and get all that information about these plants as well. So uh, keep that in mind. But the next question, of course, when you do introduce your plants is, where are they? And of course, everybody is going to say they are not visiting my garden. And one of the reasons for it is of course, high traffic. Too many people, barking dogs, feisty cats, you know, when there's too much activity, they obviously have options as pollinators to visit other gardens. So 
It's maybe the tranquility of a garden that may attract them. And, and of course, they uh, have that instinctive nature to always uh, deter from anything that would make them um, prey. So many times they don't know this, but if they're pollinators, they don't know if you're gonna shoo them away or try to kill them off. Many people often do. So um, if they see a lot of activity in your landscape, it might just be because it's just too much high traffic. Um, but obviously another reason is extreme weather, whether it's too cold or too hot or it's raining. Um, obviously hibernation or migration is another thing to consider. And that obviously is nothing personal, it's just the timing uh, on the occasion, why they're not visiting. And of course, we move on to one of the final reasons and that in most cases, especially or particularly in cases where people are just starting their landscapes is that there's not enough trees or shrubs or plants for the nesting or the protection of these um, pollinators. Remember pollinators are only gonna stick around when they feel that they are not in any kind of threat and an environment that may not be mature enough may not be reason enough for them to risk um, becoming a prey to others. Um, remember there's a balance in, in life and as pollinators, they are also, um, they are also potentially prey to birds or other, um, others as well. And one thing that I wanna share with you is that you also want to provide a water source. Um, that is going to be something that is going to attract them as well. So not having a water source may obviously be one of the reasons that they don't come into your landscape. And how you can introduce it is through a uh, bird bath. And I would suggest adding marbles or pebbles or something so that they don't come in uh, full and dive and potentially drown but um, changing out the water, of course, so that it doesn't uh, become mildewy uh, or grow algae is a good thing. Um, and the final thing, the one thing that we all may eventually at one point need to make a great effort to ensuring for all of our pollinators is to not introduce chemicals to the plants. Pesticide, insecticides, herbicides, they all have an impact on their, um, on their interest to come and visit, of course. And if they do, it may just be a deadly one. And in this case, I remember, remember we talked about the neonicotitis pesticide. You're gonna find this little label in plants on occasion from your home garden store, from your nursery. And it's an indication that it has been treated with it. It's intended to only treat aphids, white flies, beetles, and mealybugs. And yes, those are pests, but because many of these um, pollinators also have, um, are impacted by them and can potentially also die, you wanna be more conscious of what you're really introducing into your landscape. For those of you questioning what you could do with your aphids or flies or your mealybugs, uh, honestly, you can treat them uh, on instant. Um, mealybugs can be treated with isoporic alcohol, just directly swab them or, or spray them. And uh, aphids can be treated with a mild um, uh, Dawn dish soap um, water um, and you, want to wash that off, of course, because it also affects pollinators. It's an instant, uh, it's an instant uh, removal of these particular uh, problematic uh, pests, but you also have to be conscious that you have to hose it off and that is going to protect your pollinators. Um, let's see what we have next. Oh, we wanna talk about um, EVMWD's customer rebate programs. Now, for those of you that have not yet purchased a weather-based irrigation controller, please don't wait. You can start off with an $80 rebate and it can control up to less than an acre of landscape. Now, the reason that this is pretty important is because 
on occasion, especially in the Inland Empire, we have weather that is really radical. We can have cold, snappy fronts that come in and then, you know, a few days later have up to 90 degree temperatures. And if we were to be diligent, we would have to be consistently changing our manual irrigation timers. With these, you don't. It's automatically taken care of for you. And it's really a no brainer. It's a smart uh, controller, of course, and it will take care of all the adjustments on your behalf based on the weather itself. And then of course we have rotating um, sprinkler nozzles. Now these nozzles are more efficient than your traditional nozzles. They don't have a sharp spray, therefore reducing evaporation and runoff. Uh, but these are excellent for those of you that want to maintain a California natives plants because they do very well with these type of sprinklers. Um, one thing that I have found over the years is that California natives don't really thrive with drip irrigation watering. Um, for those of you that may be wondering or wondering why you have had problematic situations with California natives, usually that's one of the reasons um, that they don't thrive with direct water. They like overhead spray as it would be in nature with a rainfall. And speaking about rainfall, Keep in mind that you also can obtain rain barrels starting at a $35 per barrel rebate and up to two barrels. And this is a great means of when and if we do get rain that you are prepared to save um, these, uh, these barrels full of water and can do so just by connecting them straight from your rain gutters. And for those of you that have large properties and want to consider uh, cisterns, 250 to 350, depending on the gallon capacity is what you can get for a rebate. And of course, another little gadget to add to your weather-based irrigation controller is a soil moisture sensor system. This of course is going to let the irrigation know how moist your soil is. And it, you don't really have to assess it. Many times we assume that the soil is dry because the surface is dry but this will give you a accurate reading of whether it is or not. And it can start at a rebate of 30 per controller for less than an acre and 35 per station for more than an acre. Now, one more thing that we wanna share is the turf replacement rebate that are $2.25 per square foot for up to uh, 5,000 square feet. And it's available on a first come first serve basis. So don't assume that just because you're now considering it, it is available. Please visit um, Southern Cal, um, southerncalwatersmart.com and learn more about it because there are some guidelines that you have to abide by in order to be eligible and apply. You do have to have a green lawn for those of you that have stopped watering and considered it, you may not be eligible for it. So please go to the website and see all the details about it. But this is a great way of adding that landscape that you're looking for by removing that water thirsty lawn and saving more water for the near future. Yes, and I just wanted to real quick with the turf replacement rebate, um, that, that is probably the largest rebate we offer. And, uh, you know, I always, if you're interested in removing your grass and converting it to be more water efficient, I definitely recommend that program. It is, that one's a little different from a lot of other rebates. That one you do need to submit an application first before beginning work. So if you're considering doing something, definitely look into applying first before beginning. Um, and as far as the grass goes, there, there is some leniency. We understand that we've been not getting a whole lot of rain. You know, we've been going in and out of a drought here. So as far as the grass conditions, it does need to be visible that there is grass. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a lush, super healthy grass. Um, like I said, there's been some leniency with that because you know we are trying to have, help people cut back. Um, so, you know, if you just have dirt and weeds, unfortunately, that, that wouldn't qualify. But if, if you still have, you know, visible grass there, then I highly recommend applying if you're interested in taking that out. Awesome. Okay. Now we have a few more things to talk about with uh, EVMWD uh, customers. There's rebates also for the residential drip retrofit. Um, and we're going to just talk a real quick briefly about the benefits 
obviously you can save up to 60% water savings and it's an easy installation, a low maintenance. You obviously are entertaining a lot fewer weeds because it's really watering directly into the plant root zone and it allows the water to seep slowly into the soil and it reduces the runoff that many of us are a victim to. And of course, it reduces the loss of evaporation. So it improves water efficiency. And I would definitely recommend it for those of you that are interested. Um, I, there's also more information on page uh, 115 of the Southern Cal Transformation Book with regards to how many emitters per plant and information in regards to the installation. So be sure to look at the Southern Cal uh, yard transformation book for more information as you do consider this as an installation. And of course, uh, they do offer um, up to 25 cents per square foot for a maximum of 2000 square feet for converting an existing sprinkler system to drip irrigation system. Now the rebate cannot be combined with a turf replacement uh, program, but of course the drip um, conversion equipment and installation must be completed by June 30th. And Haley, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little more about that with regards to more information. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So um, if that's something you're interested in doing, that one's a little different from the turf replacement, because let's say you already have a, a planter that's being currently irrigated by sprinklers and you want to convert it to a drip irrigation system. It's a lot more of a simpler program versus completely taking out all of your grass. This is really for like those smaller areas that, you know, you just want to merely upgrade your irrigation system without actually having to redo your the rest of your your landscape. Um, so if you have any kind of planners or just small, small areas that you want to um, convert to the drip irrigation system, I definitely recommend looking into that. Um, if you were, are interested in applying, make sure you save all of your receipts for the application. And it, it does say June 30th is a cutoff. However, this is a continuous program we will be offering. So if you, um, you know, you comes July 1st and you decide you want to take advantage of it, we will be continuing this program past June 30th. Awesome. That is great news for everyone. So for those of you that have um, maybe those planters or potted containers that you want to, you know, uh, spruce up, please keep these, uh, these retrofit drip kits in mind because they will be a lifesaver for you to not have to consistently water and it becomes a habitual actually you know, to rely on this system because it's a lot more efficient than we can be as people with our busy lives. So keep that in mind. Now, again, that does conclude um, our pollinator garden uh, workshop. And going back to the inspiration, we certainly hope that this program has inspired you to bring in a little pollinator garden into your landscape. And whether it's a formal, meticulous and manicured landscape or an informal, just native looking, beautiful, lush uh, pollinator garden or even container gardens, we certainly hope that you do entertain them because in the long run, we are really dependent. We are the ones that are dependent on these pollinators for our personal existence and obviously the food that we consume and our, in, our entire environment itself. Um, don't forget, you have the InlandValleyGardenPlanner.org resource. Take a good look at it. It is such an easy website. I love it because you can definitely find all the plant information that you're looking for. And I know that many of you were probably hoping that I might be able to spend a little more time with some of the plants, but I think that you will not be disappointed by just particularly looking for what you need and log in, create an account and create that plant list for you, that wish list or even that purchase list that you can take to the home garden or your nursery so that you can start that pollinator garden. Now, I did share a lot of information with regards to one of our resources and that's the Southern Cal Yard Transformation Book. And Haley will be able to share with you where you can find this resource on their website uh, because it is a downloadable website um, a link that you can uh, you can utilize, and it's you know going to provide you so much information. Now, the reason I love this book is, of course, because it was a collaboration of many experts of various fields, 
and they were all collaborating on providing information to the Inland Empire. So you're not obtaining a book that may have been written by maybe a, a professional gardener or a, a person that may be in the East Coast or the Midwest. This is for our Southern California area. So for those of you that may have even further questions that go beyond the topic, be sure to look into it, download it, and it'll help you with a lot of things. There's a lot of troubleshooting that you, that a lot of troubleshooting charts that are very, very easy to read and are going to be a, an, enormous, an enormous resource for those of you that will continue to do your gardening and landscaping. Now, before we conclude, we will also be providing you with um, the, another resource, which is uh, an opportunity for you to email us at Inland Empire Waterkeeper at info at inlandempirewaterkeeper.org. You can submit any questions that may come up over the weekend uh, regarding this particular pollinator garden subject. Be sure to email us to EVMWD, Pollinator Gardens 2021. And whatever question in regards to this topic that you have, we will be glad to provide you an answer. So. We thank you again for joining us and for being a part of this program. We know that um, as you've gained a lot of information with regards to pollinators and information that you may not have known or even information that just might be a refresher for you, we do thank you for entertaining the pollinator garden in your landscape because you are collaborating with a greater cause that we as people are responsible to ensuring that pollinators continue to thrive and perpetuate into our the future. So thank you again, everyone.